Well, today is just one of those days that's just kind of heavy because of the things we have to talk about today. And there's need for us to talk about it because there's a need for the church to step up and do something about it. We're really glad that you're here on what is being called Freedom Sunday, celebrated in hundreds of churches across our country, as we take a moment to just take notice of those who need us to stand up for them. Uh, I don't know about you, but everything in my life that I put attention to, it all began when I began to notice there was a need for attention. I think back to several years ago when our church decided we wanted to do something about Africa, and so we needed to build an orphanage over there in Uganda. We were very excited about that. We raised money for it. We sent people over there, and teams went over to help out. It was a great venture for us. But several years into it, I realized, you know what? I really need to go over there and see it. And it's not that I didn't believe in it, because I definitely did. And our family had, um, you know, sponsored a child over there, a little girl by the name of Monica. And, and we've been, you know, communicating with her via letters for a few years now. But it really needed to go see it. And so our board of directors headed over there about three years ago just to visit there and see what was going on. And we knew it would be a difficult trip to just get there. It's uh, not all the, you know, the easiest place to get to in the middle of Uganda. And we flew into London then flew into Entebbe. And then we're going to take a little tiny plane over into Lira, which is where the orphanage was. I didn't understand all the details behind that, though. And when we landed at the airport in Entebbe, my understanding was now we get our bags and we get onto another plane and fly out of the airport into, into Lira. But then we didn't. They put us on a bus. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Why are we leaving the airport if we're going to fly again? Well, apparently the plane we were going to take took off in somebody's backyard. And so we went to this house out in the middle of nowhere. And then in the backyard was this huge field and a plane sat there. And the security for the plane was to go through the house where they would unpack your bags and shake everything. Because I guess they thought if it's going to blow up, let it happen down here rather than up there. You know, that's always best. And so they load it all back up and then they weigh everything because they need to know if they're going to exceed the weight limit on this tiny plane. And as they're weighing it all, there's a guy sitting there with a little pad of paper writing down everybody's weight. So we all weigh in, then all the bags get weighed. And about halfway through it, he loses count, which is real, you know, you know uh, encouraging. And uh, he begins to kind of, you know, carry the one and just, ah, forget it. You guys go. Okay, is that like good luck and we'll never see you again, or good luck and we think you'll be fine. And I'm looking around at everybody, kind of weighing them in my mind, wondering, you know, should you go? I don't know. So anyway, we all get on the plane. It takes off. We fly over the Nile, which was pretty cool. And then we land in Alira. And the moment we land, all the kids from the orphanage come running up to the plane. And in that moment, all the difficulty of getting there didn't matter because you began to see these kids. And I see Monica, and we get onto a bus, and all of us load up, and we head towards the orphanage, and we drive through a part of town which is just desolate, and the whole bus gets silent, and it's kind of the solemn moment because we're driving through where the war took place, where the LRA came in and wiped out just thousands of people, specifically these kids' parents. And it's one thing to hear about it, but it's another thing to see it. And when you see it, you tend to want to do something. And it all starts when you notice. I think that's kind of what's going on in our country right now. It's like we're all beginning to notice there's an issue with racism in our country still today. Even though many of us kind of thought it was all over with after the 60s, it is still prevalent. And you hear these horrific stories as the pressure begins to mount between law enforcement and and, and people that are minorities and the racism issue continues to, to play out, whether it's in Charlotte or Dallas or other cities. And we hear all these different conversations from both sides of the equation. And you just know this is bigger than we thought it was. And it starts when you notice it. And when you start to see it, that's when you start to do something about it. And that's the same thing that's going on with this issue of slavery. Many of us thought slavery was over after the late 1800s. But the the truth is, as Steve said, over 45 million people are still enslaved today. Many of whom are women and children. And many are being used in the sex trafficking industry. And it's not okay for us as a church living in suburbia just to say, that's too bad, and go back to our normal daily routine. 
It's incumbent on us as the church to do something. Historically, Real Life Church has always been a church that we just run towards the mess. There's a problem, there's an issue, let's go towards it and see how we can fix it or help it or add value. And this has to be one of those things that we move towards. Right now, we've been in this series around here called When You, Then God, and we've been talking about how God has these principles for us where he says, when you do X, then I will do Y. And he's kind of saying to us, I'm asking you, I'm daring you, take me up on this, and I want to you know, put resources behind you to just exponentially do great things. And the reason there's so much trouble in this world today is because we as a church just haven't stepped up and done something about it. And when it comes to this issue, it is time for us as a church, as the church collectively, to do something to step up for those who can't step up for themselves. Over the course of this series, we've talked about things like when you build your life on the rock, then God gives you an unshakable life. We've talked about when you, you know, remain in Jesus, then God helps you begin to look like him. Last week, we talked about when you invest in his kingdom, then he invests in yours. And today, we're going to look at one final when you, then God statement that's really going to help us understand what we can do and what we need to do and why we should do something about this issue of slavery. There are some times when Jesus talks, it's like encouraging and it's helpful. And there are some times when he kind of turns up the volume a little bit and he kind of gets right in our face and he says, listen, this is what you need to do. And the passage we're going to read today is exactly what Jesus does. He's got a lot of people around him. He's talking about different things, and he gets into what is often referred to as the signs of the times, many of which are referring to the the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. But some of it gets into when Jesus returns the second time, which was really confusing for people back then because they don't know why he's talking about returning because he's already here. But now he's talking about, I want to come back another time. That's the end of time, and that's when everything will be separated out. And he gives us this incredible passage, which really causes us to take pause and ask ourselves, are we truly prepared? Take a look at what he says here. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. Now, we don't know if that's a literal throne or if he's speaking metaphorically here, because back then people definitely understood the idea of a king and the throne and all those kind of things. And so Jesus is casting this picture of when I return, I will sit in a seat of authority over everybody, because here's what's going to happen. All the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Now, for us, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense because we don't deal a lot with sheep and goats and all of that. Uh, For us, he probably would have used something like a large dog and a coyote, okay? They're all together in a big mass here. You separate them out. But for them, he talked about sheep and goats. And the reason that they would become confused is because after a sheep has been sheared, it looks a lot like a goat. And in that big flock of sheep, goats would wander in, and they would have to go through and separate them out. But catch this, because this is huge. The only way you can tell that a goat is a goat, not one of the sheep, is by its behavior, not just by the eye test. You have to watch for a period of time to see how it behaves, and then they begin to separate. Here's what he says happens then. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. In other words, those on his right, the sheep, they get to go into heaven. And he's beginning to tell them, listen, this has been created for you from the beginning of time. It's going to be awesome. Here we go. And then he says this, the reason why. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. For... Uh, the, the four basic needs that we all have right now are listed in these six things. Food, shelter, clothing, acceptance. And he says, you provided that for me. Well, everybody listening is confused. Well, I don't recall when that happened. I'm glad I get to go to heaven, but can you explain to me when I did that? And he, here's what he says. The righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? In other words, when did we do that? I don't ever recall seeing you in need or having you into my home. And Jesus answers this way. 
I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. The time you stopped and you helped somebody on the corner of the street, the time that you invited someone to stay at your house because they had nowhere to go, the time that you brought a meal to somebody who was sick, the time that you went and visited somebody in prison, the time that you packaged meals to be sent over to the other side of the world, the time that you helped rescue somebody from oppression, you were doing it for me. You were providing that for me. In other words, when you noticed, then you did something. And you did it for me. Then he continues. Then the king will turn to those on his left and say, but away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry, you did not feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. In other words, you all did just the opposite. You didn't help at all. You never even noticed. To which they respond with the same kind of question, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick and in prison and not help you? Jesus, if I'd seen you on the side of the road, I would have stopped. Okay? If you'd knocked on my door, I would have let you in. If you had called and asked me for help, I would have taken care of you. When did we ever neglect you? And Jesus replies, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. In other words, when you fail to notice the least and the last and the lost, it didn't help me. And then he says these chilling words in conclusion, and they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. He's talking about heaven and hell. Now, I know this brings up a question in a lot of us that goes, wait a second, I thought we were saved by grace. This looks like we're saved by our good works. How do you reconcile those two things? How does that work together? Here's what Jesus is saying. Yes, you are saved by grace, but your trust in that grace is shown by your works. In other words, how do you determine the sheep from the goats? By their behavior. And how does Jesus know that we have put our trust in him? By our walk more than our talk. More than just saying, I prayed a prayer. I went to church on Christmas and Easter. I got baptized. I was baptized as a baby. My grandma's a Christian. No, 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 no. What'd you do? Because your relationship with Christ is shown a lot more by your walk than your talk. And here's what he's saying. You want to really put your money where your mouth is? You want to really be a Jesus follower? Then you care for those that are the least and the last and the lost. You notice them and you run towards them. And here's the payoff. This is our when you, then God statement for the day. When you bless others, guess what? That God blesses you eternally. That's just the payoff. Now, here's, here's what I, I keep thinking about. These people had the same question that a lot of us have, but I thought I was good. I thought I was doing great things. I thought we were good, you and me, Jesus. And here's what he's saying. Here's how we're good. If you do good, meaning you live like I lived. Does it change my love for you? Love you. But I need you to step up and love those who are the least and the last and the lost. You know what I've noticed about our lives? Any change comes after you become aware. I mean, think about it. For many of you, you didn't really think a whole lot about cancer until somebody in your family was diagnosed with cancer. Well, then you were educated about it. You learned about it. You went and you helped out with support groups. You started giving money towards it. You went on walks because you were invested, because you became aware. You noticed it. The same thing is true for many of us when it comes to uh, children with special needs. Many of us, we didn't think a whole lot about it, but then you met somebody or you volunteered with your life group to help out with Fun Life on a Friday night or you volunteered for the prom called A Night to Remember that we hosted a few months ago for students with special needs and now you're forever changed because you noticed and you got involved. And the same thing is true for many of us when it comes to Africa. You didn't think much about it, but then Bono started talking about it. You thought, well, I better pay attention now, you know? And so then we started doing something as a church, and you started giving to it, and then you went on a trip, or, or you helped package meals with Million Meals, and that's just the way real life is. We run towards these things, and you've done it, and you become aware because you noticed it. Well, friends, it is time for us to do that with this issue of slavery. 
Because we're going to be held responsible for what we did for the least, the last, and the lost. And it's not enough for us to sit up in suburbia and say, boy, that's really rough for them, and go back to our carpool line. We have to decide to do something about it. Because Jesus says, when you do it for them, you're doing it for me. Well, this is what happened for a guy named Gary Haugen. Gary was a guy who was an attorney, and then one day he noticed the issue of human trafficking. And he decided to put together a group of people who were attorneys and social workers and retired law enforcement officers and said, listen, let's create an organization that goes and we, we help these people get out of slavery. See, the problem with the issue of human trafficking in third world countries is the people doing the trafficking, they're not punished. And so what happens is, is they might get a slap on the wrist, but the money's so good, they just keep going back to doing it. And so International Justice Mission was founded by Gary and his, his team of people because they went in to set up a system where they could rescue kids out and they could prosecute those doing the enslaving. And they're seeing slavery go down in those countries. And so it just so happened, their process is, let's get together, let's pray, let's work with the government and see how we can do this. And they've been doing this for several years. Well, one particular time, several years ago, they got together in South Asia, and they're just praying about, God, what can we do? What can we do? How can we end slavery over here? And a government official called them and said, we think we found some slaves that we want you to go and rescue. They said, no problem, we're on it. They told them where it was. They began to get a task force together to go in there and rescue these people. And they thought they'd have about 15 to 20 people in there because that was normally what they would find. They got there and they found 514 people, many women and children, enslaved. They rescued them. They prosecuted those that were doing the enslaving. And those people's lives were forever changed. One of those individuals was a young boy by the name of Kumar, one of the thousands and thousands of people changed by International Justice Mission. And I wanted you to hear his story. Take a look at this. You're working 14, 18 hour days with very little sleep, no freedom, dignity is taken away from them. And, and that's something nobody should have to endure. We had a number of years ago, two of the bond laborers escaped from a facility. And they were tracked down by the owners of the facility and, and brought back. And as a punishment for what they had done, their hands were chopped off. We would go to the government officers and we'd say, sir, there is a bonded labor case. And almost always the response was, there is no bonded labor in my area. What are you talking? How much? 30? Yeah, yeah, I'm afraid. Can you, there's a girl who's very afraid. Almost unable to walk. This is Kumar. He was abandoned by his mother and his father was suddenly killed. Orphaned and alone, he was accountable for his parents' debts. And at just seven years old, he was forced into slavery. Kumar remembers a day where he was so ill he couldn't get out of bed. Immediately, his owner came looking for him. Kumar was trapped by debt and a slave owner who beat him continuously. He, like so many, had no remaining hope for a way out. IJM discovered the horrific conditions in the brick factory where Kumar and others were being forced to work against their will. Ashley Landon and Angedra, Jansano Marana, 
And based on their undercover video evidence, local government authorities and police came alongside IJM to conduct a rescue operation. The more and more we are doing these rescues, people are getting aware that people are being abused. There is bonded labor, there is trafficking. Also, the law is going to take its course as well as perpetrators go behind. When the team arrived in the morning and entered the brick factory, 15 men, women, and children were rescued and given their freedom back. Then, they were each given a certificate to prove that they no longer owe any debts to their former owner. And one was for Kumar. After being rescued, IJM placed Kumar in their aftercare program to heal. You, you'd ask him a question anytime, no matter what, and he would say, the one thing I want to do, sir, is I want to study. He was clear about that. And then they enrolled him in school for the first time. Today, he is studying to be a social worker to help those still suffering like he did. And what we do at IJM is we go look for that lost sheep, that girl that's being abused, that widow who's been run out of her home. And we will search for her until we find her. That's how our Father has loved us. That's how we are called to love others. Not to search for them until we've satisfied ourselves. Not to search for them until it gets really hard. But to go after them until we find them. To be relentless in our love. We hear those stories, we think, man, that's great. I love hearing that, but what, what can I do? How could I possibly even change lives like that? Well, you were given a card on your way in, and if not, you can receive one on your way out that just tells you the three things we're asking everybody to do this weekend, and that is to know more, to pray more, and do more. To know more is just to be educated. We become aware of something, and then we get involved in something. Go to the website that we've set up and find out more information about what is going on and what we could do to stop it. The second thing is to pray more. I doubt any of us pray for those that are enslaved right now, to pray for them, to pray for the people that are working to rescue them, and to even pray for their captors, to have a change of heart and just set them free. That is certainly something we could all unite around and pray for. But the third thing is also to do more. You know, you are already doing something. If you contribute anything financially around here at Real Life, you are already helping to rescue those enslaved because part of our resources go to International Justice Mission and also Saving Innocence, which works to, to rescue kids from uh, human trafficking right here in Los Angeles. Just by your financial contributions around here, you are already helping. But there's still more we could do. If you go to that website that we've, we've put on that card right there, there are a variety of different options that you can do right here from where you live, even right now in your lifestyle, and be able to help other people, to know more, to pray more, and to do more. You know, I, I, I sometimes just think about how amazing it would be if all of us would just start with this idea of praying about it. Because when people pray, God responds with us. 
I always think about this incredible story of this guy by the name of Bob. Bob was a guy who was an insurance salesman in Washington, D.C., and he met a guy named Doug. And Doug was a guy that ran a ministry in Washington, D.C. to help out people who were politicians and state officials and, you know, kind of unite them together who were also followers of Jesus. And he meets Bob. He shares his faith with Bob. Bob becomes a follower of Jesus. And they get together for breakfast every now and then just to talk about Bob's journey in faith. And Bob would ask him questions. Well, one particular day, they get together for breakfast, and, and Doug and Bob are talking. And Bob goes, hey, I got a question for you. I read something the other day in the Bible. I want to know if it's true. And Doug said, sure, what is it? And he said, it said, Jesus said, ask anything you want in my name and it will be done. And so he looks at Doug and he goes, is that, is that true? And Doug says, well, yeah, it's not a blank check, but I mean, that's certainly, you know, God answers prayer. And he goes, well, then I should start praying for something. I think I'll start praying for Africa. And Doug says, okay, Africa is a little big. What about maybe just one country? Bob said, okay, I'll pray for Kenya. And then Doug goes, have you ever been to Kenya, Bob? No. Do you know anyone in Kenya? No. You're just going to pray for Kenya. Yep, I'm just going to pray for Kenya. And Doug thinks, I know what's going to happen here. He's going to pray a few days and then forget all about it. So he issues him a challenge. He says, Bob, here's what we're going to do. I want you to pray for Kenya every single day for six months. And if at the end of that six months you haven't noticed God do anything, I'll give you $500. But if God does something you give me $500. And we don't normally encourage gambling as a way to start praying, but, uh, you know, whatever it takes, right? And he said, but here's the deal. You got to pray every day for six months. And if you miss a day, the whole deal's off. And Bob goes, okay, I'll do it. So he starts praying for Kenya every single day. Don't even know what to pray for. Just God, would you bless Kenya? Would you show me how I can help out? You know, those kind of prayers. Every day for four months, this goes on. Nothing happens until one night, Bob is invited to a dinner there in Washington, D.C., and he's seated at a table with about seven other people. He doesn't know anybody there, and they all go around and do introductions, and one woman across the table says her name and that she runs the largest orphanage in, you guessed it, Kenya. And Bob zeroed in. (laughs) He began to ask her questions about the orphanage, and in his mind, he's thinking, I'm going to lose $500 right now. And she begins to tell him all about the orphanage. And after a while of these questions, she goes, you seem very interested in Kenya. And he says, let's just say I'm heavily invested in it right now. (laughs) And she said, well, have you ever been to Kenya? No. Do you want to come and see the orphanage sometime? He said, I would love to. A few weeks later, he hops on a plane, flies over to Kenya to visit this orphanage. And he's appalled by their lack of, of, you know, medical supplies that they need. So he goes back to the States and he writes a letter to every major pharmaceutical company. And he says, you guys throw away so much stuff. Can you send it to this orphanage instead? And they do. Over a million dollars worth of pharmaceutical supplies are sent to this orphanage at the end of the year. They're so overwhelmed. This woman calls Bob up and says, we are so amazed by this. We want to have a party and celebrate this. We'd love for you to be here. Can you come? He said, I'll be there. He goes over to this celebration. While he's at the party, guess who shows up? The president of Kenya. He's come to meet this guy named Bob. (laughs) He meets Bob, and they start talking, and he says, would you like a tour of the capital city? And he says, absolutely. So they're walking around the capital city. They go by a prison, and outside the prison is this group of prisoners, and Bob says, who are those people? And the president says, they're just a group of political prisoners. And Bob just instinctively says, that's a bad idea. The president says, excuse me? And he says, you should let those people go. He goes, whatever, Bob. And they just kind of keep on walking. (laughs) Bob goes back to the States. A couple weeks later, he gets a call from somebody in the United States State Department. And they said, is this Bob? He said, yes, it is. You been to Kenya lately, Bob? (laughs) Yes, I have. Did you meet with the president? I did. Did you say anything to him about some political prisoners? I did. I said he should let them go. The guy on the other end of the phone says, Bob, we've been trying to get those prisoners released for the last two years. But last week, they were suddenly released by the president, due in part to some guy named Bob. (laughs) We're just calling to say thank you. Now, here's what's really cool. Not long after that, the president of Kenya contacts Bob and says, Bob, 
I got a big decision to make. I'm reorganizing my entire cabinet, and I need some prayer. Would you come over here, and would you just pray with me for a while? And Bob said, I'd be glad to. All because the guy said, I think I'll pray for Kenya. And what if we started praying? Not a couple days, every day. I bet there's more stories like Bob's right here in this room, right here online. God could do some amazing things. Because when we bless others, that God not only blesses us eternally, he blesses other people as well. Let's pray together. God, thank you for stories like Bob's that encourage us to be that kind of person that just says, I'm not sure what I can do, but I'm just going to pray. God, we want to know more. We want to pray more. We want to do more. For some of us, that's going to be actually maybe going to help out, maybe joining with IJM, maybe fighting for those who are enslaved. For some of us, it's our contributions, it's our prayers. But God, would you make us aware? We want to notice because we know that to see something is the start of something. And so God, make us aware and tell us what it is you want to do. God, we pray for those who are enslaved right now. We speak up on their behalf. We ask for your provision for them, for their freedom, that the hearts of their captors will be changed and they will just let them go. God, we pray for justice to be provided. We know that you are a God of justice and grace and you can bring that. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at this time, we're going to move into our time of offering. I invite our ushers to go ahead and prepare for that. Hey, we do celebrate that around here because we get to do things like contribute to great organizations that end human trafficking. And you may have come today not prepared to give, but you think, you know what, I want in on this. There are so many different ways to give through the app, through uh, your phone, obviously, through the website, but also that envelope on the seat back in front of you, you can either fill out here, drop it off in the bags, the black boxes as you leave, or even mail it in. For those of you that filled out your cards, you can also drop those in the bags as they come by. For those of you that are first-time guests with us, drop those off at the kiosks as you leave. We'd love to put that free gift in your hand. And for everybody, next weekend we kick off a brand new series called Under Further Review. Sounds like a football term, so we'll have a little bit of fun you know, with some football terminology. But also, we're going to be doing a deep dive into all of our relationships and some several things that really ruin them and how we can fix those. Make sure you're here and make sure you bring a friend. It's going to be a lot of fun as we do kind of an under further review on our hearts. Let me pray for our offering. God, thank you for what you've given. And now we give back to you a portion of that to say, take and use this to help those in need. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.